And um, in Tariq Mahmood, you get the father trying to impose, or, or the elders trying to impose values. You get it done beautifully. And Abdullah Hussein wrote a most beautiful novel in English called Emigre Journeys, which is hardly known here. I don't know why. I mean, he wrote the Odas Nasli and all that, but this novel, in, it pre predates Nadim's. And there you have working class people going to Britain. At first, it's just about, you know, survival. But then when they become settled and their children come, they want to induct their children into the culture that they've left behind. Right. And the children rebel or mm -hmm. can't cope. Or just don't respond the way that they would have thought that they might. No, no, yeah. they don't respond the way they, they, they like. And in fact, Abdullah, this, this uh, novel, Abdullah Hussein's novel is actually written in two voices. The daughter, who has been locked up in a cellar, and the father says that she's possessed by a jinn. I think she's refusing to marry someone that he's chosen for her. And the second voice is that of the father of when he came to Britain and what he suffered and what he endured. He came as an illegal worker and how he was inducted to Britain by a chap who came to his village and said, you know, leave everything and how he was ambitious and so he went there. What happens is when you hear the daughter's narrative talking about her father and the father talking about himself as a young man, you, they're, they're two different people. Right. Of what he becomes. Right. So, it, it, it is there, but I think you get it more in diaspora writing than in the writing of the well-traveled law. Right, right. Now, Sadia, you have uh, done uh, work on uh, African women writers uh, beyond uh, Leila as well. Have you found commonality, uh, thematic commonality in terms of a concern with parenting, a concern with the mother-child relationship? Uh, amongst other African women writers as well. Is it a dominant theme? Does it appear the way that it does, for instance, in Leila's fiction? Um, there is this um, notion of motherhood, which Leila talks about in Birth Summons, where um, we, uh, we've been told that Moni was very ambitious and very you know, handsome woman who kept her man waiting for some time before she said yes. And um, after becoming a mother, she sort of gives up on life, yeah. So, Lela, that particular um, line, actually, in that uh, book, which says motherhood hadn't slaved her, but it dent her resolve, put her in her place. It sort of reminded me of Buchiya Macheta's The Joys of Motherhood. Because in The Joys of Motherhood, she... Um, um, she was talking about the conflicts of the joys of motherhood and she sort of questions um, or condemns the evolving form of collective identities which view women or value women only as producers. So, um, so I'm just thinking, uh, since you were talking about the laws and, you know, first, second generation laws, is it because uh, because that's, that was a big connection for me between your work and Emma Chaita's The Joys of Motherhood. Um, and I'm, it just came to my head while I was reading it, um, because many African women writers, they've started questioning this institution of uh, motherhood, because the idea, I remember, I don't remember the exact name of the author, but I think Adrian Kennedy at one point, her son asked her, um, she asked her son, is it possible to love someone 24-7? And she said no. And uh, the son said no, and she said, why do you expect mothers to love you all the time? Mm. So I'm just thinking, was it, is it because the child was not well, or you're also uh, trying to deconstruct this entire notion of this supreme mother and this undying and, you know, sort of love, which puts huge pressure on women? Oh, the, 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 uh, the, the lady in the, in the book, her name is Moni, she, her first baby is uh, severely uh, disabled, and so she uh, is a shock for her, of course, and she has to really, you know, uh, requires a lot of care, a lot of, uh, of, of physical care, um, and so she finds herself um, completely, you know, submerged in this. She used to be a successful banker, she was, you know, uh, a career woman, and then now she's completely uh, overwhelmed by the demands of this uh, disabled child, she's also fiercely protective of him. She's she's.
horrified that her husband uh, doesn't even say the name of the, of the son. He can't bring himself to, to, to name him. He calls him just the boy. And uh, she's under pressure from, uh, from her husband and from her family to have more children. You know, so their, their attitude is that, okay, you gave birth to a disabled son, you know, he can't be cured, so let's just put him aside and we move on and have other children. And she's resenting that, you know, because she's devoted to her son and she feels a satisfaction in looking after him. She feels that when the doctors say to her, oh, you're a good mom, you know, you're, she, she feels happy, she feels proud. She feels that, that she's achieved something. And um, th there's a kind of irony to that, 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 that someone like her, who's so intelligent, who's got her MBA and everything, that she, need, that she finds so much fulfillment in, um, in, 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 in being told that you're a good, you're a good uh, mom. So um, um, it's not really about, ex uh, I don't think I was making a point about the expectation, just, just exploring the natural feeling, the natural feeling that a woman would have if she is in this situation, in this, this, in this situation, especially in our cultures and the way disabled people are treated in our cultures very uh, poorly. And this makes Moni uh, love Britain. This is the side of her that makes her want to stay in Britain forever because, you know, th there's respect for her son, you know, there's care that he's going to go to a school and the husband wants her to, you know, come with him to Saudi Arabia and have more children and just, you know, move on. And she's like, she doesn't want to, she doesn't want to, 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 to move on. So she's kind of conflicted in, in, in that way. Right, and this was just fascinating because on the one hand, we have this representation in other stories and books of the immigrant parents, as we'd said earlier, dealing with the disappointment of their children, uh, not listening to them, not following the path that they want. And over here, we have a parent who would do anything to stay in Britain because the needs of her child will only ever be met properly over there. So just sort of, you know, demonstrating the various uh, sort of uh, influences and, and things which affect these people. We have very little time, actually. Um, okay, so I, I just, just yes. wanted, just, just on this subject, um, because I had done some volunteer work at a special education school, I thought the treatment of the special child, of the ch a child with cerebral, the relationship with the mother, um, uh, her treatment of him, the, the, the family conflict, the fact that, you know, her own family, or uh, someone, someone even suggested it was her fault, it was beautifully done. I, I, I really like this, really the was. treatment of, of the child and the mother. It was beautiful. I mean, yeah. the book is a beautiful book, actually, but, so. Yeah, yeah. So very quickly now, uh, there were a couple of other things which I wanted to discuss, but we won't have time for them. Uh, I just wanted to also commend you for the way that you have created these women characters as allies. Mm -hmm. And that's something which I've noticed across a lot of your other fiction as well, that the women are not necessarily propped up in opposition to each other. They're not necessarily trying to cut each other down. Uh, in many different stories, you've got the mother and the daughter, the daughter who tries to understand the mother's perspective, the sister who tries to understand her sister's perspective, etc. And in this book also, they fight, but they're basically on each other's side, which is very, uh, very good to see. Was that something that you consciously worked into your fiction? Or again, uh, do you feel you're, as a woman writer, perhaps, uh, that came in more? I just, I believe in the sisterhood. I believe that we do you support each other. <laughs> we right. do support each other. We right. right. We, yeah, I think we, we're good at that. I, right. I don't have any sisters myself, so I don't know what it's like to have a sister. Um, but, but, but I have, you know, friends and, 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 and close friends. And, uh, and so I, um, and I, I see whenever, uh, I see examples whenever somebody in, in her own life, you know, has a, has a, has a, has a problem. There is a, a kind of, the women do rally around and we do kind of support each other. Right, yeah. absolutely. And Sadia, just very quickly going back to what you were saying about uh, uh, women and, uh, and uh, faith. Uh, I want to connect that to this idea of, so in faith-based societies particularly, uh, women would often play the role of enforcing uh, a particular following of the faith. 
uh, we tend to attribute that to patriarchy, but within the household, often it's the women who are who are uh, assisting that system and doing that, right? Uh, in your own research, and uh, particularly with regards to literature from this region, uh, have you come across? Uh, yes. Have, have, what kind of treatment have you seen? Um, female bonding, I think it, uh, Lennox was also very close to Mariam Abbas' heart because um, uh, according to Ba, female bonding and female camaraderie is extremely crucial to, to fight against oppressed social uh, codes. And Mariam Abba uh, has written two novels and then unfortunately she died. And then So Long a Letter and the other one, Scarlet Song, there was this huge emphasis on female bonding. And um, the female camaraderie and amity was something which sustained her characters during the difficult times. And when, um, and as you said, there's this female bonding and camaraderie here. But um, I remember in the translator and also in Minaret, uh, all the men in Najwa's life, they disappointed her. And then she decided to go to Mecca to perform Hajj. And then faith somehow became her companion. She started relying on faith. And there wasn't any... Um, female around with whom she could bond with. And then in, in the case of Summer, after having this quarrel with Ray when she wanted him to convert him, he said no, she went back to uh, her tomb. And there, when she was there, she realizes that her intentions for Ray's conversions were pretty selfish. But even then she kept on praying for him for his sake. So here Faith also became a companion for Summer. And Summer also doesn't have any sort of female friend. The only friend, sort of friend slash colleague was a Pakistani woman who was extremely cynical of a growing affection towards a, towards a white man. And she at one point said, oh, mixed race couple, they do upset people, <laughs> you know? So, but here, there was this strong female camaraderie. And even Nawal and Sadavi, a uh, woman in point zero, that girl suffered because she had never had that sort of a bonding, even with her mother. And um, I think Purple Hibiscus by Dicci also yearns for that female bonding. And same goes for Sitsi and Gramga's nervous condition. So was it a conscious effort? Were you aware of that, that desire and that yearning for female bonding in all these women rights work and their emphasis? Because, you know, in African feminism, there was this huge emphasis on female bonding because this is their politics. And for them, this yeah. universal idea of sisterhood is actually sister archy, right. Western sister archy. So. Right, right, exactly. It's so interesting how it how it plays out. Yeah. yeah, and even in bird summons, we see that these women are allies, but at the same time, they're also policing each other. Yeah. Yeah. So when one of them starts developing issues with her hijab, the others are mortified. There's not a single woman in there who's saying yes, yes, do what you would like to do. They're all saying what. <laughs> How could but you? they sort of made their so, peace towards the end. They were like, right, you know, exactly, she yeah. stay the same amount. <laughs> so um, we we are actually sort of reaching the point where I would have liked you to read something. And one of the things we haven't been able to touch upon, which is an integral part of this book, is the magical realism that she has used. And I believe this is the first time. Is that right? Or yeah. yes. So the first time that you've used magical realism in your work. Yeah. Um, uh, since we haven't been able to talk about it. It would be lovely if perhaps you could read out a passage for okay. the audience and perhaps you could just get a taste of the way that she's employed the supernatural. Okay, so this is the first time in the novel that we encounter anything, uh, uh, anything uh, strange. So this is, the, the, um, the novel moves between the characters of the three women, but this part is, relates to the youngest character who's called uh, Iman. Uh, Later, lying in her na narrow bed underneath the open window, Iman could see the night sky. It would never be completely dark. They were too far north for that. Instead, pink twilight glowed over the western horizon. There were clouds that looked round and full like candy floss, and ones that were as flat as milk stains. Low streaks of light touched the ground, as if there would never be a deep, dark night. In the east, there was a crescent, low, orange, and perfect. The stars were distant, much more distant than she could remember seeing before. Back home, her family slept outdoors in the summer and indoors in the winter. The desert gave them scorching heat and bitter cold. Hers were a hardy people, able to adjust and pickle and organize. But it was not memories of home that Iman embraced, not memories of walks along the Euphrates or vendors willing grilled corn. Instead, 
Her ears caught the sound of wings, a rustle of movement, sounds that, are, that were at first gentle, but then became distinct. Through the window, a shy creature hesitated, asked permission to come in and speak to her. I am dreaming, she thought. I am dreaming, and this is a good dream. The creature was a bird, but it belonged to the night. The creature could be a bat, but it had feathers. It spoke a language that she could understand. It knew her from long ago. It had traveled with her all those miles, never left her side, was always there, but only here in this special place could it make itself known. Yet it was not entirely visible, not exactly. For when she looked at it directly, it disappeared. She had to pretend she was looking in another direction or at something else for the orange, black, and white to materialize again. But this was not a problem. Iman wanted to listen to it and talk to it more than she wanted to look at it. The creature had a name, Hupi, it said, named after the bird in the Quran. You are too big for a Hupi, said Iman. You are fat. She was not afraid to tease it. <laughs> he said, you are bigger than me, but I know more. I can find hidden sources of water. You are stronger, but I have flown further. I have seen east and west, north and south, inhuman creatures that trail purple clouds, remote forests, trapped people, animals as big as giants, humans as small as clowns. I've seen surplus building and tearing down. At times, I've seen nothing because in some places there was nothing, nothing alive. But all things submit to the rule of time. We can't stop it moving. It pulls us forward. It takes us away. There is no escape. I'm here to warn you, do not stay here in this cottage at this loft for too long. Oh, I love it here, she said, a room all to myself and the cupboard full of clothes. I don't want to leave. This is not a destination, but a strange, but a stage, she said, the stage of consequence, where what you do and what you want and what you secretly think will take a tangible shape. Things you will see and experience leave before this happens, continue. We are going, Iman said, to visit Lady Evelyn's grave, the three of us. Only one of you will get there, the Hoopi said, the one who is least distracted, the one who has learned that to keep going, it's best not to look right or left. This confused her, and she started asking why, how come, how did he know. When she got no reply, she wanted to know which one of them it would be, Moni, Salma, herself, which one of them would visit that difficult to reach place. Say Iman, she begged. Say Iman, she begged. <laughs> oh, nice. Thank you. And this is before they go to the grave, obviously, when they're at the uh, middle spot where they stop yeah. for a few days. Yeah. Uh, we have 15 minutes, a little less than 15 minutes. Uh, were you able to give the... So we'll be opening up the... Opening this up to the question and answer session, and to save time, we requested people to tell us from in advance that they wanted to know. There's someone behind the pillar who I cannot see who wants to ask a question. Mm -hmm. And could you please identify who you'd like to ask the question of? Is it Leila or one of the others? Um, hi, how are you? I'm very glad seeing you here because uh, I read all of your books, and uh, this one I'm uh, just started reading it today. And uh, it's great being you here. Mm, and uh, my question is that like, uh, you used uh, um, the, term, the, the bird, the creature in it, the magic realism, the use of this bird. And uh, I guess that as if the use of this bird in the novel is creating a, a kind of a question, compelling the characters to question the balance between faith and uh, femininity. And uh, as I uh, uh, felt in your other fictions as well, that the way you take and make your characters to question the balance between faith and uh, femininity and loyal and loyalty and love and sacrifice and these emotions. So is it really a conscious thing you do? And how do you uh, bring Islam as the, uh, base, uh, always the thematic thing in the center of your novels? And how do you think that um, Islam as becoming the part of your fiction enables you to um, uh, bring your fiction a more place in the Western, um, uh, Western, um, you know, the reading. So, uh, 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 I mean, like, uh, is it something like is you take the Islam and you take the, uh, the term faith in your fiction? So, I'm just curious to know that uh, do you do it consciously all the time? 
the way the faith and Islam and uh, or uh, right. how does you experience this? Okay. <laughs> so this is about writing, isn't it? Yeah, I think I uh, I really want not to write. I want to be writing in a way that I'm not looking over my shoulder. So that I, I don't want to be self-conscious. I don't want the writing to be self-conscious. Uh, I see that, you know, with, with other writers, and it's something that, that I, uh, you know, I, I don't want to see it in, in, in my own uh, work. So I try as much as possible uh, to have everything uh, feel natural, to have everything feel kind of or organic, that it comes from from the characters, from the, from the situation. It's not sort of uh, added in. It's not, uh, there's no strain uh, in, in involved uh, in it, you know. Um, so um, it, it's just so to me. If it's not if it's not natural, then I wouldn't I wouldn't feel like I, I would think it's wrong to, to write it that it's not uh, rational. So I'm not really bringing together. I'm not forcing together two things that you know uh, and putting them together just to create an opposition. You know, I want it to to, to, to have a natural. I don't know if that's if I'm answering your. Uh, your question in in, 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 in in that way, but in a way, I've so I so I've started. For example, um, uh, I could have had the three women, not all of them Muslim, or not all of them practicing Muslims. I could have had them, you know, different in that way, and then there would have been a a, a, a conflict or a clash be between that. But I felt that that would be artificial. You know, I I want. I mean, why would they be together? I wanted them to be all. You know, because I thought that would be more natural that they're all, uh, you know, within that they're all Muslims, that they're all friends, that they're all, you know, and that would give us a, a deeper conversation rather than have someone uh, <coughs> represent, uh, you know, that uh, a very uh, liberal point of view and the other person represents a very conservative view and they kind of like have these conversations, which. They're great when, you, when, when they're read as in a non-fiction piece or in an opinion piece. But to me, like, like fiction should go a deeper level. Um, and so that's kind of how, how uh, I, I do it, I suppose. Yeah. Great. Uh, there was someone on that side who wanted the mic. OK, you've given one. OK. Aslam alaikum. It's a pleasure to have you here with us and uh, to see you in person. Um, I have uh, two questions, I, they'll be really short. Uh, first is, what is the significance of the title Bird Summon? Why the bird? And what made you add this surreal or mystical element in your fiction when I read the translator and Minaret and I, I feel they're like realistic fiction, so what made you add this element in your novel? The other question is that uh, you mentioned that the experience of Hajj uh, from the point of view of women. And I see that at the end of Minaret, Najwa also takes the money to go to Hajj. So why Hajj? Is it something personal or, or have you been to Hajj? It's like, is it uh, autobiographical? Why this uh, experience? Uh, if, it's, uh, if I could just request, perhaps if you could answer one of the questions and then after the session, you, know, right. you guys okay. can so give, also uh, chat about it because I can see this very eager sort of okay. readers of your work over yeah, here. But we have quick. a couple of other people who want to ask some questions. Yeah, I'll be quick. Yeah, the, the title Bird Summons, actually when I was writing the novel, I, I wanted, I was calling it the Hoopi. So it was all about this, the, the character of Al the Al Hudhud, which is the, the, the bird. But then my publishers felt that not everybody knows what a Hoopi, hoopi is. You know, so I thought I'll change, uh, I'll change it. I won't call it hoopy because people will be like, "What's the hoopy?" They don't know what it is. So I changed it to this idea of the of the of the bird uh, of, of the bird uh, summons. Like, so that's uh, that's it. Yeah. And the magical magical realism part of it. Um, I think my intention was the idea that they were going on a journey and that they were going to have a mystical experience. That was the the the, the, the that was where I was I was heading. Um, and then, you know, I don't remember exactly how I thought of the, when did I first think of the Houthi, and I, I don't remember that, but I remember just the idea that, that, that they were going on this journey and that there was something uh, that was going to happen, and at first I didn't know what it was going to be. Yeah. Sometimes
sometimes I think the novel just kind of runs away from yes. you on its own, and you just all you have to do is gallop after it. <laughs> uh, there was a lady on that side. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be in this session, and uh, it, it's a double pleasure to see that some woman has ventured into the field of mystical uh, literature, because we don't generally see women going into that, especially not in fiction. We don't see that happen. So what I want to know is, is this your own internal uh, feeling or is, are you inspired by any writers, particularly any mystical writers? Because we do have many mystical writers around the world, especially in this part of the world. We did have some very famous mystical writers. Uh, are, are these your own musings and are, is this your own uh, brainchild or are you influenced by any writers, Western or Eastern? So this. Uh, this novel was uh, very much uh, influenced by Farid al-Din al-Attar's Conference of the Birds. And this is a fable about the birds of the world, they get together and then they choose a leader who is the Hupi, also the Hutud, and then they go on this journey to find their leader. And uh, so uh, I was c kind of influenced by that, the fact that they, they, the women are getting together and that they are going to, to find their leader. They say we want you know, to go and, and be inspired by this lady, Evelyn Cobalt. So th this is, the, I read it, I read the, the conference of the, of the birds while I was uh, you know, writing it. Um, it's, it's difficult to read, and, uh, but I found a, a, a good uh, translation. I found a translation that was kind of uh, modern and accessible. And so it, 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 it got me in, into it. And of course, all these parables, uh, which, which at the end of the book, I say where I got them, them from, Rumi and um, the Khalil and Dimna, they all have these kind of hidden wisdom to them. I mean, you, they, you, that you're, 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 it's a story, a simple story about animals or something like that, but then there's a, a deeper meaning uh, to it, which is, which is good. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Um, yes, the person who has been trying to get the mic to, no? All right. Uh, first of all, it was wonderful listening to you. And uh, my question is that uh, your fictions present uh, alternative narrative narratives through the mouthpiece of uh, your characters. But uh, do you think that uh, providing such alternative narratives will actually deconstruct the binaries? I'm actually talking in context to uh, the uh, politicized image of East. I'm making faces because you're using all these big words. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, how uh, will you comment upon it? Um, maybe. Uh, I mean, I know that uh, most of the writers, uh, especially, uh, they are presenting, especially the South Asian writers, as they are emerging, they are presenting alternative narratives. But the, on the other hand, uh, the politics of representation, the technique which is employed by West, okay. it is also very strong. So how to combat with such technique? Okay, yeah, so uh, let's, let's talk about rep this business of representation. Yes, this is, this is problematic because you, you sit there in, in, in the West, I sit there in Scotland, for example, and uh, I am writing about a culture which is not the culture I'm living uh, surrounded by. And so, uh, you know, I'm in a way representing this culture, or at least on, 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 on paper. And, uh, and this, is, this is awkward, this is a, a problematic relationship, because at the same time, you want to, as I said, uh, you want to write freely, you want to write, uh, you know, uh, organically, you want to be telling the truth, at the same time, you, you are being, uh, you know, uh, your, your, your publishers are, are Western, your, uh, most of the readers are, are, are Western, and in a way you are uh, telling them about something that they, not only they don't know anything about, but they, they have hostile feelings towards sometimes, or they're prejudiced against sometimes. And then if you become defensive in the writing, that's gonna spoil the writing, you know? So you can't really be totally defensive. You have to be careful. You have to still keep it within fiction. You have to still keep it, you know, uh, real. You don't want to, um, 
you don't want to, just because they think that, for example, Islam is oppressive to, to women, I can't then suddenly create all these wonderful, happy women to show them that, no, this is not true. You know, I still have to write about the reality of, of, of the, my community or what I see, see around me. So uh, it's, it's a difficult thing, and I think part of the, of, of, of the thing about writing is, that, is, is to, to push all this away and to enter the, the story and to enter it sort of intimately and to kind of like pretend, almost like an actor on, on stage. When an actor is on stage, they, 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 they know the audience is there, but they're pretending that the audience isn't there, you know, because they're they are focusing on what they're doing. So as a writer, you have to be this, the, you have to just kind of enter the space of the, of the, of the novel or the story and try and block out all these, uh, all these things. Um, otherwise, you know, it's y your uh, your work is going to be uh, this. These things are toxic to your work, and so you really have to protect the the, the work from, from from all these things. Yeah. That's a, I think a great note on which to finish the session, and I think that really picks up on how beautifully what we would say in Urdu, halke hat se likna, meaning that you um, you tell the story with a light hand, you write the story with a light hand, you don't allow any of these other things to come into it, and the story then eventually tells itself. I think if there's any way to describe your fiction, it would be that. Uh, Laila, thank you so much for being with thank us you. today, and thank you, Sadia, thank you, Mamunda. A very special thank you to all the people in the audience today. We've loved having you here. Thank you so much. If you'd like to uh, pick up the book, which, as you know, is not even available in the UK, then uh, please head on to uh, Hall 2, and yes, Leila will be uh, signing the books over there in so Hall where 2. Where do I go? Is it in the Hall 2 foyer? Oh, yeah? Okay. So I'll let uh, me just request one of the others to take you. Yeah. All right, okay. okay. Of course? Yes. Just a little bit short of 6 p.m., but I think we've got more than enough people here. It's uh, so, so lovely to see all of you over here. A very warm welcome and assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you. Our, uh, our session today is, as you know, a book launch uh, of this title called Bird Summons, which is uh, by Leila Abu Leila, the author who is sitting in the middle. Uh, I'll start with introductions, just so that the audience gets to know a little bit about the three people who are on our panel today. But first, uh, I'm the moderator. My name is Afia, Afia Aslam, and I represent Desi Writers Lounge, which is a platform for new writers from South Asia. Um, so let me start with the star of the evening, which is the author. So Leila Abu Leila was uh, born in Cairo, yes and then uh, grew up in Khartoum, uh, went to university over there as well, and then after that eventually shifted to Aberdeen. So a very interesting and uh, very diverse uh, heritage uh, herself, which has translated into her fiction. Um, she's been long-listed for the Orange Prize, shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, and has won numerous prizes for her fiction, uh, which includes novels and short stories. Uh, and the most one of the most prestigious prizes has been the Kane Prize, um, and then many others as well. Uh, Leila often writes about the Muslim experience uh, in Britain, uh, and particularly Muslim women uh, tend to be at the center of her stories. Um, next to me, we have uh, uh, Muniza Shamsi. Uh, Muniza is a Pakistani writer, critic, literary journalist, uh, editor, a uh, bunch of different hats that she, she wears. She's uh, author of a literary history, which is called uh, Hybrid Tapestries, the Development of Pakistani English Literature, and is the bibliographic representative of the Journal of Commonwealth Literature. Thank you for being here, Manisa. Uh, and last we have, but not the least, by by any <laughs> stretch of the imagination. We have Sadia Zulfiqar. Uh, Sadia is an academic. She teaches women's writing, post-colonial literature, and African-American literature at the Lahore College for Women University. 
Uh, she has worked on Leila's fiction as a researcher in several capacities. I can see her students in the audience who are nodding and smiling while I'm saying that. Um, she has uh, written about her, I think, in her thesis also you'd mentioned, Sadia, and then eventually in various other volumes that she's edited and she's written on. Um, her monograph, uh, African Women Writers and the Politics of Gender, was published in 2016. So the book that we are here to discuss primarily is Bird Summons, which is the new novel by Leila Bulela, and I should mention that uh, the UK release date for this is 7th of March. So we're all very lucky that we, at the end of February, are being able to buy this book over here, which I think kind of feels good. Uh, thank you for making sure that that was possible. Um, we will talk about the book, of course, but there is so much in this book in terms of themes which intersects with the themes in the rest of her work that I really wanted us to spend as much of this session as possible having a broader conversation on Leila, her life, and her work and the ways in which that intersects with the new novel. So just to begin with Leila, it would be lovely if you could, in your own words, uh, tell the audience what Bird Summons is about. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, this 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 new novel, uh, Bird uh, Summons, is uh, is about three uh, women, and they're all. What they have in common is that they are uh, the three of them are immigrants, and they are the three of them are Muslim, and the three of them are Arab, even though they come from different countries. And they go on a road trip um, to the highlands, and the reason for the Oh. The reason for the road trip yeah. okay. the reason for the road trip is that they want to visit the grave of uh, a real lady, and this is a real person, called Lady Evelyn uh, Kobold. And Lady Evelyn Kobold um, in, uh, in the 1960s, uh, went and did uh, a pilgrimage to Mecca. She went on Hajj, and she was um, a, a Muslim convert. She converted uh, to Islam, uh, and uh, she was, of course, a very unusual person. And she's uh, counted as the first European uh, woman to to perform the the pilgrimage to go on Hajj. And she wrote about it. She came back and she wrote a book called Pilgrimage to to Mecca. And uh, the book is important because it's. Uh, it shows the pilgrimage at a certain time uh, when she did it, and uh, it shows, uh, sorry, she actually died in the 1960s, and, and she, went, uh, uh, she went on pilgrimage in the, in the 30s, in the 1930s. Um, and it shows the, 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 her experience from a woman's point of view. And, uh, and uh, there's not many women who have written about the Hajj, or we don't know many women who have written on the, about the Hajj. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the literature we have is, uh, is, is about men. So this is what made Lady Evelyn um, Cobalt special. And so these three women uh, for whom Britain is not their real home, uh, they, the, the idea is that they were going to go and visit the mother of Scottish uh, Islam, in, 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 to visit her grave and to read Fatiha at her grave. And the three women each have a, you know, um, a problem. They each have personal issues with their lives. They're also very different because one of them is in her 40s, one is in her 30s, and one is in her 20s. So they've got different age, age groups. And, uh, and then once, once they start off this, uh, this journey, um, they, uh, they stop somewhere near a, mon a monastery. And this is, where, this is when the novel starts to become uh, to have some magic realism uh, elements uh, to it, and uh, you know the, 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 what happens is that one of the women um, encounters the, a, a bird, a hoopy bird, who tells her stories, and in general things start to become a little bit strange at that point in in, 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 in the novel. So um, that's that's what the, the, the book is about, and I'm happy to be here in, in Lahore for the first time. It's my first visit to Pakistan. It's my very first time to talk about the book to, to you know to readers. So I will always remember this. I feel that Lahore has a 
uh, kind of a mystical atmosphere, I would say. It's very, very special. Um, I don't know what it's like for you to live like this all the time. You're lucky. <laughs> I don't know whether you feel it around you all the time, but I feel it coming from somewhere else. It does have this kind of like, uh, not peaceful, but kind of like it soothes you down a, li a little bit, you know, and um, it's a nice uh, feeling, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, it's our pleasure to have you here in the Hall, Leila, and I hope that this is the first but not the last time <laughs> that you will continue to come. Right. So, um, moving on now, now that you know about the basic premise of the book, which is a very interesting one about this pilgrimage that these three women make to the grave of someone who they, none of them knew personally. Yes. Um, and and the, you mentioned how the women are, three women are very different from each other, and the only thing that really connects them is that they're all members of an Arabic-speaking Muslim women's association, yeah. right? And the trip is actually supposed to be planned. This pilgrimage is supposed to be planned uh, for all the members of that, of that association. Uh, you also mentioned that all three of them are immigrants. So I think it would be great to start this conversation to kick it off with a discussion on immigration, <clears throat> something which I feel uh, has been personally very relevant to you. Uh, you yourself are an immigrant and a lot of your fiction has drawn, I think, on your own personal experiences as well. Uh, would you be able to talk a little bit more about that, in a way take it back to the beginning, when you first moved to Aberdeen and what your experience was like as an immigrant and how you started the process of writing fiction after you moved there? Okay. Well, um, I had uh, grown up in, in Khartoum, in the capital of Sudan, and I studied statistics. And my mother actually was, um, is, is a demographer. She's the first woman demographer in, in Sudan. And uh, the plan was that I was going to go to London to the LSE. I was going to get a PhD in statistics and I was going to go back to Sudan and teach the statistics. Uh, but this didn't work out. My life uh, went in a completely different uh, direction. First of all, I couldn't get the PhD because PhD is very difficult to get. <laughs> so, so everyone who has one should feel very proud. So I couldn't, I just didn't make it. And also my husband's work took him to Aberdeen, to Scotland. And so I suddenly found myself, you know, stuck at home with little children, no support from an extended family. Uh, I was pretty miserable, homesick and all that. And, but I've always loved reading, I've always loved reading, and being in the UK meant, you know, a public library and I could read, so I was, started to read a lot. And then I thought, well, maybe I could write something, and I started writing, and I joined the creative writing group at the University of Aberdeen. It was like an evening class open to the public. And it stayed uh, at the level of a hobby, but then, um, you know, things picked up and people started to encourage me and so I continued and then I continued, I got, uh, I got published. So, I was really starting to write, uh, to express the feelings of homesickness and the, and, the, and the challenges of being an immigrant and that kind of stayed a, a theme with me. So, no, so even though I went from book to book, I still carried with me the, the, the theme of the outsider, the, the person who's, uh, who's moved to a different uh, place which they're having trouble to settle in. So, Muniza, um, just kind of trying to bridge the personal experience of the going to Britain, uh, grappling with identity issues, and how that, uh, sort of, and trying to bridge that with, uh, with her work. Uh, you've also had uh, your own time that you've spent in Britain, growing up over there. Yes. And uh, you, you're seeing the themes that come repeatedly in Leila's fiction, which are about these issues, immigrants in Britain who are dealing with identity issues. How were you able to associate with or relate to what was written, what you read in her fiction? Well, uh, yes, my, this is on, my experience of being Britain, I was not an immigrant as such, my parents were here. Um, and I came from one of these uh, you know, sort of ex-post-colonial families. They say my father was sent to school in England when he was eight, and he came back at 25. I was sent to school in England when I was nine, and I came back when I was 19. Um, what I relate to in her fiction is, well, it, it's partly the things you left behind, partly a sense of reclamation. Um, 
in in um, in bird summons, of course, there's this um, this strong sense, oh yes, and of expectations of women. That was also, you know, one of her characters, for example, Salma, uh, had gi given up um, her medical career, and there was this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, marriage it was to an Englishman, but it was a, considered a good marriage. And so she has this hankering, this sense of the doctor uh, that she never was, and um, wanting to go to a hospital. Um, it's very strange, we're talking, you know, 50 years later, I still say to people, if I meet, oh, I wanted to be a scientist once. Of course, there were no uh, such thing as a woman scientist in Pakistan. So that, mm -hmm. so that was the kind of, um, what could I say, the surreal thing of being educated in England. There you were being, uh, your headmistress is telling you, you know, go to university and go and read science. And um, my history teacher was saying, going, going, you must go and read history. But the parents said, what use are these degrees to you? You know, um, I didn't have the kind of pressures, but it, it, so there was a very personal, she relates to me in a very personal level. The experience again of um, being growing up in England after a while, I came, used to come here every second year. You start <clears throat> feeling removed from your um, homeland. You start feeling that is where you belong, that all the people around you are English. You think you're English. At, Quite soon you start realizing that uh, you, you are being disabused of this. And then, in literature, what is the representation? I mean, this is why I've said this earlier this morning. This is why I got interested in South Asian literature. What is your representation? Well, there's the Jungle Book, okay. Um, there's mm -hmm. E.M. Foster, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, where is your reality? In English literature. Yeah. In English literature. Where is the South Asian her, reality? Her, her yeah. book provides those realities. And um, again, the other thing of the little child, going back to Sudan on a visit, I don't know how, she, well, she's not so little, but she's been growing up, and she becomes aware of her mother pronouncing words, certain words wrongly, of a kind of, of a family where, you know, there's a young man, her family always hoped that one, that's terribly Pakistani, hoped that one day she would marry him. Of course, she likes him, but he's just a pal. And she's very happy to go around with him and his fiance. The family all keep thinking, I wish, you know, I mean, when you'd grown up. So there's a lot of, about her book, which is terribly Pakistani, both in the experience <laughs> of migration and both, I mean, there's the, um, I'm going on a bit, but there's the other one where the man, he, this is her earlier book, not, um, not this one, this is Elsewhere Home, it's called came out last this is year. a collection of short this stories. Yeah. Yeah. And in that, there's a man who goes back, and his mother won't, he, he got married to an English woman. His mother won't say her name. Right. You know, I, Keeps and, referring to her as, what, your wife, what's her name? Her but his yeah. mother won't yeah. say her name. And then another a relative or friend says that, you know, you did it all wrong, you should have asked her permission. He said, what would have happened? I mean, she would have said no, there would have been all these obstacles, and probably he said, I wouldn't have got married. These are very Desi stories. Right. They're very Pakistani stories, in a way. And, and yet there's a, so that's what I love about her work. It is so universal. It relates to us, and it tells us about Sudan, it tells us about Egypt. Right. And so many of the issues faced by people who've moved to the West. Yes. So these are very human issues that are faced yes. by immigrants in the West, yes. who have to think about their mothers back home, who have to think about their families, and the expectations, the burden of expectation, all of that. Sadia. Uh, since you're uh, teaching uh, post-colonial literature, and uh, it's on, okay. uh, and you would be sort of dealing with a lot of students uh, who face a lot of these issues over here. You don't actually have to leave Pakistan uh, to be facing a lot of these issues that uh, Muniza is uh, highlighting, which are there in Leila's fiction. Uh, while teaching post-colonial fiction and, and teaching Leila's work and looking at Leila's work, what kind of parallels have you seen with your own students' experiences over here? And uh, how have you been able to connect it to the local um, Experience regarding uh, immigration or generally their outlook on it towards their parallels, parallels between what her characters are going through? And yeah, what I think through, yeah. we can because um, um, women here in Pakistan, they share with um, Leila's women um, history of race and also history of empire. Mm. And these two things are very pertinent and important in Lela's work. 
But uh, you were talking about immigration, and Lela mentioned that she was homesick while she was in Aberdeen. And I was thinking that we um, come across this homesickness, this feeling of homesickness in our characters, and this nostalgia for the past life. And perhaps, Lela, I was thinking that is the reason that you have such a pluralistic approach towards faith. Because um, um, your women, are the central, they are the central characters. They are living um, in an environment which is predominantly secular, and an atmosphere which is not very um, sympathetic towards their faith. So that's, that's mostly what happens there. And then um, I was thinking the way you uh, talk about faith or the entire journey of faith is that it is very personal. Um, no one needs to implement it from outside. And um, when we read Lela, when I teach Lela with my, to my students, um, I think um, Lela's work, your work, encourage readers to think about uh, even though we are Muslims here, to think about Muslim communities not as one single homogeneous commodity, but rather as plurality of structures, each with its own distinct forms of tradition, which are not necessarily acceptable in another community. The thing which, because I'm interested in, um, in the politics of gender, I'm also interested in the politics of faith. And when I was reading uh, Bird Summons, and when at one point Iman said, I'm going to get rid of my whale, and the other two got really upset about it. Um, but then towards the end, they saw, somehow made peace with it. And while I was reading it, it reminded me of, um, 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 of Robin Yasin Kasser, because in one of his interviews, he said that, you know, uh, the cloth, the whale, has become a flag waved by both Islamists and Islamophobes to define each other. So wearing it or uh, putting it on or you know, removing it are loaded political acts. But in your work, you're talking about it as a piece of cloth. You know? So when you talk about whale as a piece of cloth, it means you're not using it as a political, as a political gambit. And um, there was... I'm going to read a few lines from Bird Summons, if that's OK. Yes. Because it's somehow connected with the experience of immigration. It's also how students who belong to you know, Pakistan and they've got their own understanding of faith, how they interact with it. I'm, uh, I really want to discuss this in detail later. So okay. uh, do hold on to some of your thoughts, because I know that your, the majority of your work is in this, and I really want to All know right. about okay. it in more detail. Okay. The things that you mentioned right now mm. are very pertinent to I feel the local experience. Uh, and when you're teaching her material, her fiction as material, as study material, do you find your students relating to that material uh, culturally? Because as Muniza was saying, there are parallels between the Pakistani yeah. experience and... They do actually, because it's mostly, it's all about um, a Muslim women experience, with the yeah. kind of anxieties they have, yeah, yeah. and the kind of interactions they are making with the other world, which perhaps is not very you know, sympathetic towards them. So they, um, um, they make, I mean, they, are, they can relate to the characters. And right. actually, recently, I taught the translator. And there was this big debate, because half of the students were like, he should convert for her, because right. she is in love. And the other one were like, no, she's imposing her religion on him. So it's a good debate. And I think the debate um, initiates, because all of them can relate to her. And right. the things which Lela talks about, I'm sorry, I'm taking too much time. No, but no, the no, thing. No. Go ahead, yeah. But the things which Lela talks about in her work are very pertinent and relevant to these girls. So they right. can see themselves in summer and also in Najwa and their own anxieties towards religion. Right. Because somehow it's, it has become a politics, it's very political. Yeah. So the idea that it's very personal, you can yes. do whatever you want to, it appeals to them because these girls, they think a lot, you know. Absolutely. I think one of the interesting things is that over here, we live in what is already largely a faith-based society. And in her books, in Leila's books and in her stories, we're seeing people leaving these faith-based societies and going into that Western secular democracy, right? Uh, and the anxiety, as you've mentioned, their anxiety is related with this kind of uh, living in one particular system or the other. And in her fiction in particular, we see the clash that comes from moving. 
So this, I'd like to talk a little bit more about this whole thing of tradition versus modernity, which comes so often as a theme uh, in your books. So these people who are shifting from these faith-based societies to these secular societies, uh, they're feeling a particular type of alienation. Uh, another thing which I think is very interesting to see is that they're feeling a particular type of disappointment. Mm. Uh, and a lot of uh, diaspora literature will harp on about nostalgia. It will harp on about remembering what was, where you came from, often making it out to be better than perhaps it even was. But this particular angle of disappointment, okay, this is something which I find you've dealt with beautifully in your work. And I wonder whether, have you consciously tried to engage with that, with that idea? Uh, in your in your fiction, or is it something that has just come naturally? Well, I think that if you grow up in a Muslim country, and I did, I grew up, I grew up in a, in, a, in Sudan, in a Muslim country. My my family were liberal. I would describe them as as, as, as being liberal, but maybe socially conservative. Uh, but at the same time, you know, religion was all around, and even today, today I was earlier in the British Council, and I was, and I noticed how some of the the the, the students there, or the... Okay, <laughs> they opened the door then. So, uh, uh, it, they, they were praying on the grass, you know, separately. It was just the time to pray, and so they, 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 they prayed. And it's just, it was just natural, it's there, it's in the background, you know, and uh, they're not, uh, if you're going to the British Council to, to, to use the library, you're not a, you know, a strict, very sort of conservative uh, Muslim, are you, or you wouldn't be there? So they're they're the type of people. So they just it's, it's an ordinary ordinary thing, and I don't think they would have described themselves as being particularly religious. But they're they, you know they they just praying. It's just, it just feels natural to them. And so I kind of I grew up th with this in, in Sudan. I mean, around me I, I hear the azan, you know, and people are praying and people are making wudu. And and then when I moved to the UK. Um, it was like I, it took me a long time to realize that this, is, this was absent this wasn't there anymore I had taken it for granted and I think we all do if we grow up in a Muslim country we take the faith for granted it's something that is just there and maybe some, a lot of us are also complaining that there's too much of it you know so it, it's really something that we, we just think, oh, it's there. If I die now, oh, well, they're going to wash me and, 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 you know, and bury me in a Muslim graveyard. But I was in the West. There were many times when I was frightened and I thought, well, if I die now, you know, what, what if nobody knows that I'm a Muslim and, and what will happen to me? And it, it made me anxious, as you, you say, these kind of anxieties. And, and so it's a human thing that we, we, we don't appreciate something until we lose it. You know, we take, we take things for granted, it's there. Every day we get up, the sun is there, or we have our health and we you know, accept, expect it to go on forever. So I think that the, 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 what I like, what I benefited from immigrating is that I learned not to take it for granted. I learned that it was something that was special, you know, and, and, um, and so this, you know, writing about it, I feel then that it is something special that I that that that, that needs to be written written about. That it needs to be uh, sort of like highlighted in a way because uh, uh, you know it, it could just easily be taken. It can be easily taken for granted. And also the shock for me because even though I had. Um, uh, I had gone to a convent school in Sudan, which is quite common because the, the Catholic schools are very good. And so this was a private girls Catholic school. So I was taught by nuns and many of my friends were Christian and I was comfortable with that and I knew that they went to church and you know they had their own faith. Uh, coming into contact with, with atheists was a, a shock for me, you know, because I had, I had really never, come into contact with, with atheists before. So this, uh, this startled me and this, you know, uh, uh, made me kind of like also think about myself and, 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 and think about the, the idea of, of, of faith and also think, of course, what, 
the question, of course, that, that you're, you're, you, fa you face when, when you talk to somebody who's an atheist is they, they say to you, you're a Muslim because you were brought up a Muslim. You know, if you had been brought up a Hindu, if you had been brought up, a, uh, if you had been brought up by atheist parents, you would have become an atheist. And the answer to this question is this, yes, of course, that's probably true. And of course, that throws you because, uh, you know, uh, you realize then that, you know, all this is just, is it, is it, it's just an accident of birth or is it, you know, I then have to find my own way towards it and, and, and make it not just, I'm um, like that just because I was born, I was born uh, uh, like that. So I think with the immigration, I think a lot of uh, people feel it, that there's gains and losses. I mean, people do.